So welcome everybody to the May 2023 CTIP CAN call. Uh, May is Mental Health Awareness Month, and today we are going to have a wonderful call talking about both self-care and collective care as we take care of our own mental health and well-being, as we continue to advocate and work toward systems transformation to take care of the deeper needs for everybody that we all work to do. And so just feel very, very fortunate to get to be alongside you. And like I was just saying to Whitney and others on the call who were on here right before too, these calls fill me up so much. And then, you know, sometimes this work can be so difficult. And just to get to be in community with all of you is truly a humbling experience. And so very excited for this call as I am for all of them. Before we get into the self and collective care pieces though, there are two legislative updates that we wanted to provide you all with. And in addition to the slides, I am putting a link to a blog post in the chat, if that is helpful as well, feel free to read it now or later on. But the Rise from Trauma Act, I believe that this is the fourth Congress that it has been introduced in. And we are so thrilled about the continuous progress that we continue to see behind the bill. It is bipartisan and bicameral. It's been introduced in the Senate, and we expect for it to be introduced into the House again soon. And there is so much good that comes out of this. Section 101 of the Rise from Trauma Act creates a new grant program that supports cross-sector community coalitions. And so it is pretty loosely defined and just creates a new funding program it's a huge priority of ours because we know that the context and the or the work is going to look different community to community based on the community's context. Uh, the work looks different. Populations, needs, resources, and desires differ community to community. And the Rise from Trauma Act Section 101 grant program creates the flexibility to give communities the support to really launch initiatives. It's um, And so we're thrilled about that. As you'll see, there's also work around hospital-based trauma interventions, um, trying to recruit more school mental health clinicians. There's other uh, work that is being uplifted out of the Support Act, which was um, the opioid-related federal legislation in 2018 that is being re-uplifted because some of it sunsets in 2023. And then there is also funding for training across many frontline service providers. And so that's the rise from Trauma Act. And then the Community Mental Wellness and Resilience Act is also a bipartisan and bicameral bill that is working to promote a public health approach to the way that we uh, respond to disasters. And really what this is working on is getting out in front of disasters because we know that there are cascading extreme weather events, community violence, and other really tragic and traumatic um, events that are cascading and are becoming almost predictable. And so what this bill is working to do is create a public health approach to building capacity and skills and connections and resources at the community level. So that way, if and when an event does strike that is dysregulating and tragic and potentially traumatizing, we can rebuild more quickly, more easily, rather than just continuing to come in with a response after these events happen. Obviously, those supports will still be there, but getting out in front of the problem and building those connections and resources are so important. And so that's a high-level summary of the Rise from Trauma Act and the Community Mental Wellness and Resilience Act. Right now, we are preparing calls to action, so please um, expect to see opportunities to engage, reach out to your local officials or federal officials and district offices about the importance of both of these bills. We're preparing some toolkits to make that easier. In the blog post, you'll find toolkits from Futures Without Violence around the Rise from Trauma Act and from the um, from Bob Doppelt's work at the International Transformational Resilience Coalition around the Community Mental Wellness and Resilience Act. We're working to coordinate some more stuff coming out of CTIP specifically but really, really excited about the opportunities of both of these bills and just wanted to let you know because they were introduced earlier this month that they have been reintroduced and we are going to do our best as an organization and most powerfully as a network alongside all of you to push these as far to and hopefully across the finish line as possible as we continue to promote community-led, trauma-informed, prevention-oriented, resilience-focused and healing-centered work nationally. And so, 
that's all from me for now. More uh, very excitingly, I get to pass it off to my brilliant colleague, Whitney Maris, who will get to talk about self and collective care and take us through the rest of the CTIP can call. Thanks, Jesse. And hey, folks, um, as Jesse mentioned, we're going to be talking about taking care and acknowledgement of Mental Health Awareness Month. So um, with a bit of what we hope is a different perspective than much of maybe what you've been seeing in ads when you're listening to podcasts or watching shows you enjoy or, you know, on bulletin boards at work um, or scrolling through social media. Um, so really, let's start there, right? We're a few weeks again in Mental Health Awareness Month at this juncture. And I'm just going to invite you up front to sort of reflect on the messages that you've received recently or just in general when you think of the term self-care. What do you picture? What are you thinking about? What comes up for you? What do you notice in your body, in your brain? And so on this slide, you know, maybe you thought about drinking herbal tea, taking a bubble bath, getting a mani-pedi, um, lighting up an expensive candle, taking a luxurious vacation. Um, any of these things might have come to mind, and that makes sense. Um, those more stereotypical things that we're told to do based on discourse that tends to reduce the idea of taking care of ourselves to this sort of narrow uh, scope that centers individual activities or these more acute behaviors that we perform really to survive in a culture driven by individualism and consumerism. It's probably what comes to mind because we're inundated with these messages, especially again during this time of awareness. And so often it's you know about something special, quote unquote, that you do every once in a while, you know, just for you, so that you can feel okay enough to cope with life challenges. Like it's a life raft, sort of keeping us afloat in a swirling sea of stress. Or it might be framed as something indulgent or luxurious that we, you know, treat ourselves to um, rather than essential to be a whole human. Um, and also sometimes, especially in certain professions, I happen to be a social worker, um, self-care is framed as an ethical imperative that we must do in order to be able to show up ethically and also to be productive, right? So only further perpetuating those very capitalistic values that our entire lives must revolve around what and how much we produce, right? And of course, there's also the fact that not everyone's 24 hours look the same. So those kinds of, especially again, for those of us who live in oppressed or marginalized bodies, right? Um, so, so those kinds of narratives can keep us in a cycle that is very prescriptive about what self-care is and isn't, who it's for, who it isn't for, um, and also keeps us in this cycle that can offer really no institutional support, right, to help us meaningfully care for ourselves beyond these instrumental sort of activities that we do every once in a while, um, or care for each other. Um, which also can pressure us to sort of maintain appearances, right? Stuff our human experience down, thinking we quote unquote shouldn't be experiencing these things, handling our problems alone. Um, these activities really are likely to address the isolation, the poor working conditions, the communities being deprived of resources, our individual feelings of burnout. Um, if we do these things every once in a while when we're feeling pretty down, right? And this isn't to say that the things you see on this slide are invalid to do for ourselves. You each know what you enjoy. You know what engages you in a fulfilling way. Really what this conversation is about is inviting you to consider that, you know, what if we thought about self-care as an essential ongoing process to support our authentic human experience instead of a quick fix or a selfish luxury or an indulgence? What if we consider the importance of not just calming ourselves down, right, or doing what we need to do again in order to meet the ever increasing demand um, for our work, but really thought about it instead as self-care being a way to affirm our overall well-being um, on an ongoing basis, a process and a practice? What if we ran toward wellness rather than away from crises in thinking about self-care? And it's also important to acknowledge that all of us here are on this call because of a commitment to changing our communities, our institutions, our systems, so that they no longer inhibit or limit access to recovery and overall well-being for all of us. And that you know this particular work can really take a unique a toll on us in specific and unique ways. It's hard work what we're doing here. Make no mistake, it can fill us, and also it is 
hard. And often we do this work without access to adequate resources ourselves. And um, it's really sustained because uh, the fact of the matter is the level of change we're advocating for takes time, right? So we're sustained in this work. It's not something that we just do and we're done. And this work for many of us is deeply personal, right? We cannot ignore that fact. It's not some thought exercise that we're engaging in. This is our lived experience. We're working to preserve our humanity along with that of all people. And many of us are doing that while we ourselves are working to process and heal from our own trauma. While um, also, you know, often in this particular arm of work, we also bear witness to trauma others have experienced or are experiencing. So. I mean, of course, a natural result of secondary traumatic stress and vicarious trauma and direct trauma exposure might be things like compassion fatigue or burnout. Um, and while sometimes we're confronted with the reality of our own humanity in these ways, um, and we find ourselves maybe temporarily taking a break or, or feeling like we have to withdraw, um, this work really doesn't feel like it's a choice for many of us in a lot of ways. And so we see all that this is continue, uh, all that is continuing to happen, um, and recognize that there's really a need to continue our efforts to fight against oppression and pursue collective liberation, and also are experiencing this all the while, right? And sometimes, again, special to this sort of work, we might find ourselves comparing our experiences to others, minimizing our needs, sacrificing our wellness with the recognition that not everyone has, again, the same 24 hours um, and might not be able to make such sacrifices. We might even pat ourselves on the back for overworking ourselves. Um, many of us feel really grateful to be doing this work. I know I do, whether paid or not. And yet sometimes that, pas uh, that passion might create pressure for us to feel like we have to show up more or to be a perfect advocate, so to speak. That might make us sacrifice more than we really even have to give. Um, you might think that taking a break is a cop-out or a betrayal to the movement. And I'm sure many of us know firsthand, you know, again, whether it's our paid work or something we do on a volunteer basis, that those types of vulnerabilities are often exploited. We continue to be asked to do more with less in so many areas of our lives. And so many of us generously give that, right? And we may even feel loved and appreciated and cared for by the organizations and groups we advocate in, which is excellent on the one hand, and also on the other hand, we might justify staying up into the wee hours responding to emails, for example, right? And the greater cause and movement ultimately suffers from these kinds of unsustainable practices. And yes, of course, we each have to take some sort of accountability for how we show up, because when it does feel this significant and personal to us, if we aren't maintaining awareness of what is showing up in our brains and bodies, we might miss cues that um, cause us to contribute to harm for others or to ourselves in the work. The less we notice what's happening for us, the higher the risk we operate from a more reactive place of trauma responses than from a place of feeling grounded and living in alignment with our values and feeling energized to do this necessary work. And so especially, again, for those of us on this call, it's important to notice the language and culture around self-care and to widen our lens, to really consider more holistically what wellness looks like and feels like. Our humanity and the vulnerability that comes along with it is not some sort of personal failing or fault that we only address when we're in an emergency and then sort of patch ourselves up superficially so we can, you know, get our noses back to the grindstone, right? Threat, challenge, change, unproductivity, um, other similar things that we experience, all of those are an inevitable part of life. And there does not need to be some false dichotomy or binary of either caring for ourselves so that we experience well-being or being valuable to the world as, as people. Simply by virtue of being human, we ought to pay attention to the ways that caring is and is not present in our lives. And so really to escape this vicious cycle, um, we really, you know, we're in this cycle, we can't get above water to really fully experience our lives. And so we offer this consideration as a way to begin shifting our thinking about the very concept of self-care. And so one way to do this is to go back to the roots of self-care itself as a concept, um, which like so many aspects of the work that we do can be traced to black feminist ideology, 
from the likes of Audre Lorde, Bell Hooks, and others. Um, and this quote really invites us to think about the idea of self-care as practice rooted in enlivening principles of self-determination, um, self-preservation, and self-restoration as an act that furthers social justice and liberation. And especially, again, for trauma survivors living in marginalized and multiply oppressed bodies, we exist in a world that continues to harm our personhood as individuals and isn't really built for trauma recovery. Um, and more broadly, our communal existence is threatened in favor of preserving an inequitable and unjust status quo. So, you know, not only are we capable of engaging in greater, more innovative action, um, both separately and together when we honor our full humanity through caring, um, but caring for ourselves and each other in lieu of our broader systems and institutions supporting us to be well and recover in the here and now itself can be a tool for social justice. So to embrace a more expansive conceptualization of self-care, we really need to think beyond a checklist of actions that we can do every once in a while and embrace the concept as a multi-layered and comprehensive holistic approach to wellness. Just like the journey to being trauma-informed, um, we think that self-care can be thought of as an everyday process and practice of learning and unlearning and relearning about what helps us to flourish and thrive and really lean into attending to the many dimensions of our lives that make us who we are. And in this framing, self-care isn't limited, again, to an activity to do like yoga or a commodity to be purchased. Rather, self-care in this frame is a lifestyle and a way of being in the world. And this conceptualization calls upon each of us to notice ourselves and to consider what internal and external factors contribute to or inhibit our ability to expand into that holistic well-being. Um, some considerations here are that self-care becomes more attainable through this framework, right? Because we can further enhance how we think about what self-care is by anchoring in our values um, and sense of meaning or purpose and do more of that without having to have access to certain types of resources. Um, this is built within us. And we might also pay attention if we're looking for things to really notice um, to what brings us joy, right? And again, not necessarily these acute activities, but processes that bring about pleasure, times we experience fun and play, we're nurturing our inner child, we're doing something that feels liberating for us. And then there's also the idea of rest as a form of resistance and care as well, right? So these are just some, some thoughts, some concepts. Um, and sometimes through this frame too, it's not about engaging our parasympathetic nervous system, that rest and digest piece, right? Um, this frame also helps us open up to the fact that sometimes self-care means engaging our sympathetic nervous system too. So, you know, sometimes we might get into this sort of toxically positive space where righteous anger is not welcome, despite the fact that of course we're angry about some of the circumstances that are happening around us and what we're seeing and witnessing. Um, and letting those go unexpressed contravenes our ability to care for ourselves and be fully human. Pretending that that doesn't exist is not going to make that go away and in fact can really cause us even more stress. And you know, consider through this framework how you can create space for all the dimensions of your humanity and all of the emotions that make you human and really engage the wisdom of our brains and bodies through our experiences to generate insight and action to help not only broader healing, but also perhaps our own healing. So again, just another part of this conceptualization is to not assume a dichotomy between caring or healing and engaging with the challenges around and inside of us. It's about getting radically honest with ourselves and drawing strength and resiliency from whatever we find within. And you know, speaking of neurobiology and the human experience, it's also important to recognize we've been told myths about needing to make it um, on our own or to handle our troubles privately, to not let this leak onto other people. And there's certainly a difference between quote unquote trauma dumping and sharing and helping one another in the healing process, right? 
So much of our ideology has privileged competition and hierarchy um, or has grounded itself in scarcity. And yet we know that this goes against our hard wiring, which tells us we ought to be in community and relationship with one another if we want to thrive. And so collective care is really about recognizing our common humanity and that we're all a part of a larger community, that our well-being is inextricably interconnected um, and that it is the responsibility of all of us to support one another in obtaining maximum well-being. Um, this is really about acknowledging the systemic situations and institutional ills that impact our mental health and well-being and also supporting one another as we work to address those situations to create a better future. So it's really about cultivating a world where everyone has access to the resources and support that they need to thrive because we're creating that. Um, so yes, we're working again toward broader change. And also we can start today to notice that the systems in place maybe aren't ready to meet the needs of ourselves and our community members. And we can take action to keep ourselves safe, to create our own nurturing networks and circles of support, to take care of one another. And again, anchoring in our shared humanity, we all need nourishment, we all need rest, we all need connection, we all need caring. And collective care is really a commitment to making sure that no one around us goes without. And so this idea of seeing well-being as both an individual and shared responsibility really draws from wisdom from concepts like mutual aid and the African philosophy of Ubuntu, um, or I am because we are. And in the context of caring, as we are talking about today, Ubuntu reminds us that our interdependence and being able to care for one another depends on the energy, the inner workings, and the characteristics of each one of us who shows up as individuals in shared spaces within our communities, and that these communities in which we live and work and play and relate um, is one place to think about this. We also want to invite you to consider communities of identification like this one, where we're all working together toward a specific goal to change our systems and institutions to be more trauma-informed. And so the thing to notice with this concept is that we is made up of a mixture of eyes right? We is not separate and distinct from our individual selves, which means that our collective is only as strong and healthy and effective and sustainable and loving and caring as the eyes who comprise that we. That is where the individual self-care piece we're talking about comes in. Because if I, as an individual, show up exhausted and empty because I've overcommitted or I haven't attended to my needs or wants, or I haven't honored my humanity, I'm not sleeping, I'm not eating well, I'm not taking the time to reflect and maintain awareness of what's happening for me, um, I'm going to show up in the collective in a way that is not as healthy and caring as if I was engaging in those activities. If I take care of myself, I am able to offer and extend care to others because I have a greater capacity to contribute to a strong and caring collective where we can share and learn and grow and relate together constructively. So we think that the fullest expression of being human really requires both self and collective care. And together, we know our voices are stronger and our experiences and outcomes are better when we know we have each other's back, right? And even when our systems and institutions don't, and maybe even more so when our systems and institutions don't. Caring for ourselves and each other can be um, a demonstration of solidarity, um, respect, and it can really help us create change that we want to see more broadly ourselves. Um, we can begin working again together to redistribute or cascade care to those who need it most or ask for it from those we're in community with for ourselves right now, today. And, you know, on that note, going back to Audre Lorde's statement, um, the idea that all of human life is worthy of being cared for, that we all can work together in abundance rather than compete based on scarcity, that runs diametrically opposed to the systems of oppression that keep trauma going. We are acting in trauma-informed ways by showing up for ourselves and others in this way. And we do not have to wait for legislation to be signed into law to begin this work. It's a this and, it is all a part of the work that we're doing. And so just to concretize as sort of a last note, 
some of this, we've included a few examples on this slide that you might consider bringing to your own solidarity networks or communities. Um, and it can really be as simple as in your community where you live, you know, offering to babysit for a community member whose family member needs to be taken to the hospital. It can be grabbing groceries for someone you know who struggles to engage in activities of daily living. Um, thinking about at work, it might be working with your colleagues to split the duties of somebody who's out on compassionate leave. Um, and, you know, while those more sustained uh, interpersonal kindness are a critical part of collective care, there also are more zoomed out kind of structured versions to consider as well, right? It might be forming a community-based child care collective or holding a fundraiser to raise awareness about and provide instrumental support to families fighting separation or deportation in the community. Support groups, community gardens, so many different things, providing healthy food, connection, networking, the list goes on, right? And you know your communities themselves best and you get to define what practices might resonate with the challenges you've noticed or align with your strengths. Um, or your community strength that really can be mobilized so that we can begin caring for each other right now. Um, and we think it's countercultural and kind of revolutionary, right? Because in a world that has been so disconnected and has trained us to ignore our humanity and is designed to on purpose keep us from joining together in solidarity in meaningful ways, um, co-creating a caring space is itself a radical act and also stands to benefit everybody. And so just sort of a, a quick overview to get your brain thinking about these topics, we want to invite you to join us in considering um, what this might feel like or look like um, and in the roles that you see yourself um, playing in this movement and also the roles you'd like to see CTIP um, take on to support a culture of caring for all who are in our communities. And so to accomplish this, Chelsea, I don't know if you by chance have the ability to drop that link into our chat. I have it open as well. I just can't find it with my tab. There we go. I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to share this document. You should be able to access. Let us know if you can't. I think I set the permissions properly to anyone with the link. Dropping that in the chat. And I'm going to build breakout rooms. Oh, waiting room participants. Everyone in meeting. Sorry. Apparently, even after like three years of everything being online, I still don't know how to use Zoom. I, I have the breakout rooms pulled up. Apologies, Perfect. taking care of the dog. <laughs> no worries, no worries. Thanks, Jesse. I appreciate it. Um, so I'm gonna I might just switch to sharing that screen to give you all a little idea and preview of what's on here. Um, again, that link to a Google Doc you can either reference or download and type in your own copy if you'd like. Um, but as usual, if you haven't joined us before, we want you to know you're encouraged to do whatever feels natural when you're in these groups. Many folks find that the structure of this document is helpful uh, and they move through each prompt. Some select one or two prompts and anchor the conversation there and others facilitate a process without paying any attention to the prompt. Any of those options are A-OK -okay with us. Um, there are five prompts on here. And then on the second page, this is the one thing we do ask you to attend to, um, and that is to hold yourself accountable to the community agreements that we've co-constructed together over the past few meetings. Um, and that's on this slide, uh, this paper, and um, not to get too meta here, but these kinds of discussions themselves can be a part of collective care, right? The reason why we fight is for a vision for ourselves, each other, and our communities um, to be places where all people can flourish and thrive and experience well-being. And it's this visioning that can ground us in how we um, treat each other in our meetings and how we listen and how we informally check in throughout the process of advocacy and activism. So we're inviting you to practice this right here, right now, by ensuring that we're accountable to these agreements, which will help us make sure we're working together to co-create a culture of courage and trust in which people are supported in finding their voice and exercising agency, um, and we, where people can ask for what they need and ask questions and draw from one another's lived experience and wisdom. Thanks, Jesse, for dropping that as a PDF. I appreciate it. Yeah, work firewalls are the worst. They <laughs> block a lot of things. Um, and so Jesse has let me know the breakout rooms are ready to go. What if you take about 20 minutes? We'll bring you back at about 10 of, 10 to the hour. And then we're going to process this out in the larger group. We're not going to ask you to like tell us every detail that you talk about. We understand that this is personal and sacred. We are just going to ask you to let us know how you experience this, what you're thinking about, and how CTIP can support you in doing more of collective and self-care. And so, Desi, let her rip.
<laughs> the breakout room. You enjoyed a thank you, Desi. We hope you enjoyed a fruitful conversation with one another. Um, we're going to spend the remaining, you know, about 10 minutes um, of our meeting providing space for you to share out. And again, while you're free to share out what you noticed about your experience in your breakout room, anything that struck you. One of the things we really want to know is how CTIP can support you in doing more of caring, period. Um, and again, we at CTIP really recognize that taking care of ourselves and each other is how we live more fully into our principles and values. And we really want to stay attuned to what you really need so we can work to respond to that um, within our capacity. We're a small part-time organization, um, but we really want to embed self and collective care in our processes. And so curious to know what you need from us in order to feel cared for and supported um, in ways that help you in your dailiness as well as show up in this work. And also happy to hear from you in terms of anything that struck you that you want to share out in the full group. And I'll just let that happen. I'll I'll pop in if needed, but otherwise going to mute myself and let y'all contribute. Go ahead, Richard. I just want to share one thing that you all have done to help us. And Jesse attended our statewide resilient Tennessee uh, meeting in Nashville last week. And that was big, a big support. Uh, uh, support to bring him down there and Jesse you can share more but uh, we had several people that went up to to Jesse after that he made his uh, presentation and 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 uh, I think thanked him for for bringing his perspective to our state because we're trying to do this at the state level like, like what you're doing at the national level we're trying to do that at the state level uh, with the support of the Commission on Children and Youth uh, of Tennessee so that's one thing that's been helpful Appreciate that, Richard. I, I just want to say that I love being in Nashville. So happy to come down there whenever or anywhere else around the country. It's truly such a beautiful part of this job to get to meet so many wonderful folks doing great work all over. We appreciate you coming. I just appreciated the, the conversation and I think um, sometimes it's helpful to hear like verbally and in the same space that stuff is tough in other parts of the world because sometimes it feels like and I I'm born and bred in Iowa I love living in Iowa but I have days where I still like you know question like should I raise my family here and the walls feel like they're closing in so it's nice to be able to have conversation this is Lorelai if you haven't met her yet um She's on a lot of our, our calls, um, <laughs> but uh, it's just nice to be able to have discourse with people in other states. Thanks, Lisa, and thanks, Lorelai, for your contributions as well. Very appreciated. <laughs> Want to also lift up in the chat uh, a great resource from Anna. Uh, there's a comment there mentioning it looks like a training to do better at caring for people in collective spaces who are resourced there. Um, and Tammy says, Jacqueline and Tammy are from Oregon and working with multi-levels of government and community. Very cool. Thanks for sharing that out. Who else wants to contribute and share? Hey, my name's Melissa and <clears throat> I um, am glad to be here. I always enjoy these calls. I am in Tennessee as well. And I, this is kind of funny, I guess, but there were about five or six people in our breakout group and we all had our cameras off and no one said a word for the entire 20 minutes or whatever it was. And I'm going to be really honest. That was some self-care or really Dr. John Ebert is our psychologist here at the Center for Excellence um, uh, for Children in States Custody at Vanderbilt. And he refers to it as we care. And so I felt like we cared for each other for about 20 minutes and just let there be silence um, because there was a hundred other things I think we could have been doing, or we can find silence in a lot of ways, but it was almost like it was prescribed. So I don't know if that's what was intended by my other breakout room nine, I think is what we were. Um, but I tend to have to speak a lot in my work. And so it was nice to kind of just not speak. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. Rest fully endorsed. Awesome to hear. Glad you were each able to meet each other where you were at.
want to lift up in the chat. Vic just posted caregivers film, excellent film um, for anybody who's interested in the topics we're talking about today. A lot of great resources on that site as well. Anybody else who wants I to? I think our group, our group Go gave ahead. us lots of good resources. Oh, that's awesome. So glad to hear that you were resource sharing. And Jeffrey, I see you've got your hand up. I'm going to go ahead and mute myself and you take the stage. Oh, thank you. I, I just thought you gave a wonderful presentation. And uh, it happens that I spent 40 years as a physician, a family doctor. And what struck me was that all the positive and constructive things that you mentioned are totally absent in the, the structure of the medical profession. And while this doesn't directly affect us as a group, uh, it affects your families because uh, doctors and nurses went through this COVID thing. There was no collective support. Uh, when they burn out, that's a euphemism for I feel totally fucked up. Uh, and very few committed suicide, but a lot drank. And they're all leaving now. So this is an unmet tragedy. And everything you talked about would have uh, moderated or mitigated it. And there is nothing still in the medical profession that creates that kind of atmosphere. And part of that is structural because on the other side of it, um, if you're trying to support a troubled physician, uh, you don't know whether that's gonna impact uh, dealing with a patient who has an illness that needs to get better. Um, so the line between that is um, very hard to, to walk, but uh, doctors and nurses are suffering in silence all around the country. And then along come the Republicans and um, uh, increase that to an exponential level by legally preventing the ethical pairing in the professions. So I think we're on the precipice of a great tragedy and all the things that you mentioned would have been, or and still are, uh, ways to um, help us deal with this problem. Powerful share. Thank you for putting that out there. Thank you for the contact. Thank you for the honesty. And just really appreciate you speaking up. Noting a lot of great resources in the chat as well for those seeking to implement this in places where there are those unspoken, painful experiences happening for people who want to bring that into the workplace or into their communities. Um, lots is happening in the chat for you to check out. And Jesse does save that chat, right, Jesse? We, we do. Share those out? Yeah, yeah. So the resources that you put in, in if you shared in the breakout rooms, we're not gonna see those, what happens in the breakout room stays in the breakout rooms in Zoom in a very literal sense. But anything that's shared here, if you wanna uplift different resources, please do, we do we save the chat um, and can share out those resources following the call and the blog posts. Rose, I think that your hand just went up. Blends in with your door very well. Oh yeah, doesn't it? Sure. Um, so in our group, one of the things that Daria and I were talking about is, you know, how like we hear stuff about self-care all the time but it's really a nice reminder of when you're also talking about collective care like none of us can do these things alone and those of us in helping professions um and caring professions are uh the worst at taking our own advice um for how to be good to ourselves so it's it is nice to have that reminder <laughs> Thanks, Rose. Appreciate that. Just noting the time and that uh, the end of the hour, want to be respectful of your time. And also, Jesse and I can hang out with anybody else who wants to sit and chat. Ruth, I see your hand up. I just want to give proactive permission to y'all to take care of yourselves in whatever way you need. And if that means popping off this call, that's a okay. We're so glad for your presence. Grateful to have been in community with you. Looking forward to seeing you hopefully again next month. Um, for the resources again, check out our blog and we'll we'll stick around. Um, for those of you leaving, take good care and be well. And for those of you sticking around, um, let's hear Ruth. Thanks.
Thanks. Uh, just a quick thing, which is that I, I love the calls um, and I come as often as I can. So I really appreciate the resources. It feels like we used to, um, we used to just take a little more breathing space on these at the CTIP meetings. We would do grounding at the beginning. And, um, you know, I don't know if it's just because I had a three hour Zoom meeting earlier today, or if it's just as time wears on, I'm just getting more and more burned out on Zoom. So I love meeting people from all over, but I don't want us to lose the walking the walk that CTIP does around this stuff of being trauma informed. It's, it's actually really important to me as someone who spends a lot of time on the computer, like to have those few minutes at the beginning to slow things down and not just be talked at. So I just want to remind us of that and appreciate it. Thanks. Absolutely. Well taken point. Yeah, we reduced them from an hour and a half to an hour. We're trying to strike that balance. We're, we're like, man, an hour and a half is a long time to sit on a computer mid-afternoon. And so thank you for that feedback. I think we'll find a way to institutionalize, bring that back in because it sounds like there's some solidarity in the chat for that as well. So thank you so much. Yeah, that's so well received, Ruth. I think that maybe that can even be something we just start the call with because it's, you know, for us, it's two on the East Coast, 11 on, you know, the West Coast, nine o'clock in Hawaii from wherever folks are joining, or maybe eight in Hawaii. And, and just to be able to have that moment while we also work to be respectful of time is a really good reminder. Um, I'll just share quickly um, and then want to open it up for others. That sometimes it's hard when there are such pressing, you know, business matters of like, get this much information out and what we try to tell our funders. And it that's really why this, this topic, and as we discuss it and try to model that and see tip in that, is an ongoing commitment to a process of learning and growth for that exact reason. We can always work to improve, but it's it's really hard to strike that balance. And so I just really appreciate, you know, the reminder of, you know, modeling the model is just so important and never losing that despite all the external pressures that exists. Um, I, I think that holding ground in our values is what is necessary to transform systems beyond where they are today. Um, so appreciate what everyone's shared and just wanted to share that um, as we work to maintain our own well-being um, while trying to support others. Anything else on anyone's heart or mind that they want to put out there while we're together? All right, then we just want to again acknowledge your, the gratitude for you showing up so fully. So glad to have been in community with you and we look forward to seeing you again next month. Please check out our newsletter as well. There are some self-care and, self and collective care resources there um, and be well. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thanks, Carrie.